it is the most powerful event that happened in the world. And all of us must be personally influenced by that event of the crucifixion of our Lord Jesus Christ and the words which he spoke from the cross. When I uh, was looking at this series for the first time, I was looking at it in amongst um, a number of famous sayings in a subject or a series called Famous Last Words. And, and there's lots of them in the Bible. Uh, last words of very faithful people that God has um, specifically recorded for us um, and the lessons they have for us. Um, but there was also an event where I lost a very good friend to lymphoma cancer and um, I had a chance to talk to him in the last week of his life. And um, it was very moving and very powerful um, for me to see his courage and his strength, knowing that he only had a few days to live and he had a young family. Um, and the difficult uh, things that were going through his mind, because obviously, you know, self-preservation, the will to survive, it's, it's, you know, in the heart of all of us. And we would all like to think we would have, you know, great strength if we were facing death and knowing that, you know, our life is just transient and there's a better promise to come. But there is still that uncertainty, that, that doubt and those fears because, you know, none of us have ever experienced death. So it's entering into something which is completely outside our world. And the subject took on different, you know, proportions, I guess, because of the loss of my friend. And in the process, I looked at these, you know, sayings from various different people on the... Sorry. I'll just go on to here. So... I looked at um, the final words of various different faithful examples, their famous last words. Um, we can think of the example of Jacob, who, um, who said to his uh, sons, he charged them and said, I am to be gathered to my people, bury me with my fathers. And, and these sayings of these faithful people, uh, it's interesting, they, they almost epitomize who they were. You know, for Jacob, he lived a life in a, in a pilgrimage which um, saw him leave and go down to Egypt, but it was a pilgrimage which would take him back into the land and to be buried with the patriarchs, with Abraham and Isaac, in, in the family plot. And in his words is, you know, this powerful message of hope. If we look at the words of David, the last words of David, and blessed be his glorious name for an ever and ever, and let the whole earth be filled with his glory. Amen and amen. The prayers of David, the son of Jesse, are ended. And, and really those words epitomize what we know of David, wasn't he? He was, he was the sweet psalmist of Israel, and he was the, uh, the young boy that played the harp. He was a man full of praise and worship to God. If we look at the last words of of Daniel, we see these words, I heard but understood not, then I said, oh my Lord, what shall the end of these things be? And of course, Daniel, who was in captivity, was yearning and longing for the time of Israel's restitution, restoration. And so, in Daniel's last words, uh, is a statement of true desire um, for the restoration of the people and of the city. If we look at the last words of Paul, 2 Timothy chapter 4, and the Lord shall deliver me from every work and will preserve me unto his heavenly kingdom, to whom be glory for ever and ever. Amen. And we see in this Paul's incredible confidence, which in itself is a story in its own, isn't it? Because, you know, Paul went through his whole life where he really had to be able to come to terms with who he was before, he, before his conversion. He had to be able to see himself as forgiven by the Lord. And, and his last words are very, very powerful as he brings to mind 
all of those things in his life that happened even before he was converted and how he was a persecutor of the ecclesia. And for him to have that confidence, to know that the Lord was with him and would deliver him from every evil work and had preserved him unto his heavenly kingdom and that there was a crown of righteousness laid up for him, spoke of his confidence that he had in the Lord. If we look at the last words of the Apostle John, which are so very appropriate um, to, the, to the character and person of John, you see the words, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Revelation chapter 22, verse 21. John, of course, whose name means grace. If you look at um, his gospel, the law through Moses came, but grace and truth by Jesus Christ became the theme of the gospel. And you see that his final words just epitomize Um, this one who was known as the disciple whom the Lord loved. And the Bible places tremendous emphasis on the famous last words of various different people. On the contrast, you have unfaithful people like Cain. My punishment is greater than I can bear. Behold, thou hast driven me this day from the face of the ground, and from thy face shall I be hid I shall be a a fugitive and a wanderer in the earth, and it will come to pass, whoever findeth me will slay me. Here's a man who um, had fear, he had regrets, and steeped in these words was unbelief. He could not believe in God's words that, Cain, if thou doest well, sin or a sin offering lieth at the door. Cain could never see himself as being forgiven, unlike Paul, and so he saw himself as condemned, and in his final words, it epitomized who he was. It summed up his life. Judas Iscariot, very similar, I have sinned in that I betrayed innocent blood. This, this was a statement of regret. It was a statement of anguish. It wasn't a statement of repentance. It was just of deep anguish and regret, and he saw himself like Cain, as condemned. So when we look at these examples in the Bible, and there's lots and lots more, by the way, it's, it's a really interesting study to do famous last words. I, you know, I, I love the, um, the last words of Goliath. I will give your flesh to the fowl of the air and to the beasts of the earth. There was just one little rock that stood in the way of that fulfillment of those words. But there, there's great examples of of the last words of faithful people and of unfaithful people in the Bible. But none are in comparison to the last words of our Lord Jesus Christ. And when I I originally did this study, I did it as a one-off study in a list of famous last words. I could never have imagined the impact that the last words of Jesus would have on my own life. And it was really the most powerful study I've ever personally done. It had an enormous effect on myself and, and I guess on our family, particularly because of some of the things that were happening at that time. We were we were going through um, a tremendous roller coaster of ups and downs, and God has a wonderful way of um, teaching you practically from the spiritual lessons you might be studying. Um, which, which is a word of warning in terms of what you might choose to study because it's highly likely that you might end up going through some trials to learn those practical lessons. And um, in this case, when I did this study, I went through some very challenging times. But for me, it was fantastic because in my relationship with God, I... In my life in the truth, I had never grown closer in terms of my relationship to God um, and, and feeling that assurity in my relationship with God, which I probably had never felt before, all of a sudden feeling safe in my relationship with God. Um, and it came through the power of the last words of Jesus from the cross. It was... A sermon. It was his last public witness. An unusual one, really, because, you know, 
crucifixion was one of the cruelest and most horrible of all forms of execution. The, the Greeks had devised the, uh, the concept of, of crucifixion as a means of torture, but the Romans had taken it to another level. They had taken it to a sadistic art form. They had devised the means by which they could keep a person alive in the most amount of pain possible. And of all the forms of torture, it was horrific, but it was one of the few forms of execution which actually provided opportunity for the victim to witness, to speak. When you think about it, you know, if Jesus had have been stoned, you know, it's, it's very difficult. Stephen made a few words when he was stoned, but, but there wasn't much of a chance to give a public witness. Jesus hung for six hours on the cross. He hung on the cross through the time from the, the morning sacrifice until the evening sacrifice, from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. And during that time, he witnessed from the cross. He witnessed to the point where he changed the lives of people. He changed the life of, of a Roman centurion, which we'll look at, a hardened soldier. He changed the life of a criminal that was guilty of insurrection and murder. Changed the lives of his beloved apostle, John, his beloved disciple, John, and his mother. Their lives would never be the same from that day forward. And the words that he spoke on the cross change our lives and are still changing people's lives. You know, he prophesied, didn't he? He prophesied that he was going to be lifted up. He knew the form of of his execution. He knew what was going to happen. And he had spoke to Nicodemus in, um, in John chapter 3, and he, and, he, and he told Nicodemus that as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so the Son of Man must be lifted up. And so he knew that he was going to be crucified from an early age. And, and it's not the first time this appears in John's Gospel. Sorry, it's not the last time it appears in John's Gospel. Uh, again, in John chapter 8, verse 28, Jesus said to them, when you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am he. And again, in John chapter 12, and verse 32, he says, and if I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men unto me. He knew that his crucifixion and his execution was going to be a powerful means of reconciliation. It was going to be the means to draw all men unto him. And for Nicodemus, he had a, had a very strong message for this teacher of the law. You see, Nicodemus was a Pharisee. He was on the Sanhedrin. He was not just a Pharisee on the Sanhedrin. Jesus called him the teacher. Art thou the teacher and knowest not these things? It's the definite article in the Greek. You see, Nicodemus stood as probably the third highest ranking Jewish official on the Sanhedrin, known as the didaskalos, he which was to investigate the, um, the claimants of would-be messiahs that would come. And he was a man who had lived his life by the letter of the law. And Jesus turned around and said, Nicodemus, unless you're born again, you won't even see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus was so far away from the kingdom of God. It took three years, but Nicodemus was eventually going to come out of darkness. The man who came to Jesus by night would eventually come out of darkness. But it took three years. And, you know, it's a, it's a, I think it's a pretty powerful lesson for us in terms of our teaching of the truth. Um, Jesus had a lot of patience towards Nicodemus. He worked with that man for three years. Imagine if you had a contact and said, right, because of his indoctrination and because of his background, it's going to take three years to actually convert him. Let's work on this process for three years. See, we kind of want to have them converted in three weeks and uh, change. But sometimes, you know, there's when you get a man like Nicodemus who's been brought up and indoctrinated, it takes a long time. So Jesus says to him this incredible um, illustration which would help him to see. You see, you know, it was going to be Nicodemus that was going to take him down from the cross, wasn't it? Nicodemus. 
as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. It would be Nicodemus that took him down from the cross. And Nicodemus was going to see very graphically what Jesus meant three years later when him and Joseph of Arimathea took that body down from the cross and the fullness of what Jesus was saying in John chapter 3 suddenly came to light. But obviously this, this lesson is so important in John's gospel because three times Jesus makes mention of the fact that it's as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness. And, and so I wanted to start by just looking at this background um, in Numbers chapter 20 and 21. Because the story of the serpent in the wilderness and is, is, comes from Numbers chapter 21. The time when, of course, the children of Israel at the end of their wilderness wanderings grumbled again. It's worth, though, just noting the lead up to the events. So when you go through Numbers chapter 20, oops, gone too far. When you go through Numbers chapter 20, here's the list of things that happen in Numbers chapter 20. We find that in, uh, in verse um, 1 of Numbers chapter 20, Miriam dies. She was like the matriarch of the nation. She was the one that sang the song of, of Miriam in, in Exodus chapter 15 about the destruction of Egypt and, and led the, the, the choir. And, and, and it would have been a very powerful time in the nation of Israel and a very sad time when Miriam passed away. And then, it, then the events at the waters of Mirabah. Of course, when the children of Israel complained and groaned because they had no water, and Moses and Aaron were told to go and speak to the rock, and instead Moses smote the rock. And as a result of that, Moses and Aaron were disqualified from leading them into the land of Israel. Now, if you were in, if you were in Israel then, imagine, imagine what that was like. Moses and Aaron have been disqualified from leading us into the land of Israel? It was very disheartening for them, wasn't it? And then, of course, um, we find that Aaron is told that he's going to die in verse 24 of, of chapter 20, and that his office is going to be passed on. So what happens is Aaron is stripped of his garments. And he dies. You know, this was their high priest. This was their religious figurehead. He was the man, the only man that was able to enter into the most holy place once a year. No one had ever gone in there. Aaron was the man that was allowed to go in. He represented the prayers of all the people, and now he has died. And he's been stripped of his garments. And so in chapter 21, it says in verse 4, when they journeyed after a 30-day funeral, and they mourned for Aaron for 30 days, and they journeyed on from Mount Hor, and it says in verse 4, the soul of the people was much discouraged because of the way, and they whinge again. They go and speak against God and against Moses and says, why have you brought us out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? There's no bread and there's no water and our soul cannot stand this bread. I was sick of it, you see. They had the same diet every day. The same, they couldn't have anything different. Um, you know, sometimes when you uh, travel around the world, you'll see that. Um, you go to Pakistan and India and places around there and Africa, and um, they, have a, they, they manage to mix up the rice a little bit and change the flavor of it a little bit, but most of the time they have the same meal every day, and most of them are pretty happy. We, uh, we live in the Western world where it's all about culinary delights and what we're going to excite ourselves with um, every day consumed with uh, the ideas of food and all its importance. God gave them the same food every day to sustain them. And they moaned and groaned. And so it says, of course, that when they moaned and groaned, God, it says, sent to them these fiery serpents. 
And, and, and these fiery serpents went around and bit them. And it says many of the people died. In fact, um, it, in fact, I think this is how much of the unfaithful died from the time of those that were uh, uh, 58 years old and above who were the faithless when the 10 spies went in to view the land. Why was it? How did God cull them off? Well, it was this test because there was another test that God gave to see if they were still faithless at the end of that 38 years. And they were still faithless because God gave them this test which said, when the serpents bite, all you have to do is look at that serpent on the pole that Moses put up there and you will live. It was easy, wasn't it? But you see, it was completely outside anything that had ever happened under the law. Because when the nation sinned or a person sinned, there was lots of work you had to do in order to be made right before God. You had to go and get an animal. You had to prepare a meal. You had to work. You had to present that to the priest who then had to go and make an offering. And if it was a national sin offering, it would be a bullock. And there was all sorts of ritual which went around that, and there was lots of work involved. There was no work. You didn't have to do anything. It was completely outside anything that had ever happened in the law in terms of reconciliation for sin back to God. Because it pointed forward to something greater. Of course, it pointed forward to the time when they would be saved by grace and not by works and you sort of wonder why so many people died don't you You sort of wonder why they um so many people died when all they had to do was look up at this serpent on the pole but you know it's easy when you think about it like that that all you have to do is look up but can you imagine my uh my um, sister-in-law's brother uh went for a walk yesterday and sent us a little video of this enormous snake that was walking in the path. And I can imagine these are, these are fiery serpents, it says. So they were probably really quick. Get the idea of, of um, you know, fiery, fast and lethal. Absolutely lethal. So you imagine if you're bitten, all of a sudden you're bitten and you can feel it going straight into your respiratory system. It will attack straight into your bloodstream. It will affect, it will suddenly start constricting your breathing like you've got asthma. Not dissimilar to what happens to a person when they're crucified. Breathing becomes very difficult immediately. And you can feel it attacking right through your body. And you can feel your chest constricting as the venom suddenly attacks. Now, the record says, when they were bitten, they were to look up. Now, can you imagine for a moment that you're there and there's all these serpents. Say you've got a family with young kids, a father with young children. Can you imagine that? Serpents there. What are you doing? Where are you looking? Will you be... Me? I'm, I'm looking to try to avoid that serpent. I'm looking down. That's where I'm looking. And I'm doing this dance to try to prevent the snake from attacking me. And Moses put a serpent on the pole and said, if you're bitten, don't look down, look up. Now you can imagine the father saying to the kids, don't look down, don't look down. But dad, it's bitten me, don't look down. There's another one, it's bitten me, don't look down. And if they stayed focused on the serpent on the pole, they would live. And that was the power of what Jesus was trying to demonstrate to Nicodemus. And, and it would be the platform for his last public defense. And so the very same word is used in Isaiah chapter 11. And that day there shall be a root of Jesse, that shall stand for an ensign. That word for ensign is the very same word which was used for the serpent on the pole, Nasai. It's the same, same word. It means a, a banner, to lift up the serpent as a banner for everybody to see. 
that uh, as an end sign to all people that the Gentiles shall seek and his rest shall be glorious. And there outside the city, away from the temple, away from Caiaphas, outside the city walls on this rocky outcrop, on this barren hill, on a dead tree hung a dying man. And that's where people would find life. And that's where we need to come. You know, coming to, the, coming to the cross is very confronting. Malva Perkis put it this way. He said, early Christians refused to look at representations of Jesus on the cross because they had seen men crucified. Our heart fails and our pen falters as we force ourselves to look at the events of the next six hours. It is a sight too terrible to gaze upon for long. We cannot linger in the shadow of the cross, but we must approach and lift our eyes steadfastly towards his. And then pass on our way with bleeding but strengthened hearts. Determined that for us, this sacrifice will not be in vain. And as we come to look at the sayings of Jesus from the cross, you know, when he first began these sayings, no one was there with him. The disciples had forsook him and fled. None of his friends. The woman stood afar off, it said. It wasn't until much later on, probably late in the morning, that John helps these women overcome their fears and overcome their embarrassment to confront the horror of what they were going to see when they came to the cross. All around him were his enemies. And he was there alone from a human perspective. And we have to come to the cross and confront all the horrors of what we see at the cross. And we have to come really close. We can't stand afar off like the woman. We have to approach, as Malva Perkis says, because if we don't, we won't hear what's been spoken from the cross. Because Jesus spoke... 37, maybe 38 words in the Greek. That's all he spoke. Just 37, 38 words from the cross. Just a handful of words. But words that change the lives of so many people. And when you look at the words from the cross, there is, con there, there is a construction about them. There is a pattern about them. There's a lesson. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Verily, I say unto thee today, shalt thou be with me in paradise. Woman, behold thy son. Son, behold thy mother. Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. I thirst. It is finished. Father, into thy hands I commit, I commend my spirit. You know, Jesus' first sermon that he ever gave was spoken in absolute idyllic settings, wasn't it? The, the Sermon on the Mount. Can you picture the scene? The green rolling hills, the Sea of Galilee in the background, crowds coming up to him. He was a man in his prime. It was the beginning of his ministry. He was 30 years old. And he stood up and um, he spoke against these Jewish concepts of legalism and obedience. That if you stayed within the confines of the letter of the law, somehow you would be all right and, and, and right with God. And he spoke all these ideals, concepts of obedience, that if you are like God, there is no need for law at all. No need for any law. See, if you love your neighbor, 
And Paul picks this up in Romans. If, if you love God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and, as, and your neighbor is yourself, you don't need to be told, thou shalt not kill. Be the furthest thing from your mind. You don't need to be told, thou shalt not commit adultery. You're driven by a pov- positive influence of love and service. Not by being told from a negative point of view what you should or should not do. And, and Jesus spoke these ideals. And it was like his first political speech. A revolutionist. And he spoke, you know, hundreds of words at this time in this ideal setting. It's like his inauguration speech. You think about the leaders of the, today the powerful leaders of the day and the inauguration speeches and the promises they make and how well they hold those promises. And uh, one doesn't have to look too far. I mean, we've got elections going on at the moment and, you know, all these political parties are just full of promises. Most of them, they break within a few weeks. And it doesn't take long for other politicians to dig up the dirt on them and to find something against them. Three and a half years later, Jesus gave his final speech. No one, not even the Jews who hated him, could gainsay what he said in terms of his way of life. No one could challenge him that he didn't live to what he preached. He gave these, this, these ideal, idealistic um, statements about how a person should live before God Three and a half years later, he had fulfilled those things in a beautiful way. Look at the comparison of the Sermon on the Mount and the Sermon on the Cross, or or leading up to his crucifixion. On the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said, I say unto you, do not resist someone who is evil. In the epistle of Peter, it says, when he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 39, it says, But I say unto you, resist not him that is evil, but whoever smites you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. Matthew 27, verse 13, And they spat upon him, and they took a reed, and they smote him on the head. Matthew 5, verse 40, it says, If anyone sue you and take your tunic, let him have your coat as well. And the soldiers, therefore, when they crucified Jesus, took his garments and made four parts, to every soldier a part, and also his coat. And whoever will compel you to go with him one mile, go with him two. And they found a man of Simon, uh, Cyrene, Simon by name, and him they compelled to go on that journey to Golgotha bearing his cross. But I say unto you, love your enemies and pray for them that persecute you. And of course, the saying that we're going to look at, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. In these seven statements, there is a message behind each of the statements. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. It's a statement, isn't it, of of mercy. Verily, I say unto thee, today thou shalt be with me in paradise, is a statement of promise or hope or reward. Woman, behold thy son, son, behold thy mother. We'll look at this tomorrow afternoon, but what a beautiful saying this is. It's Jesus' last will and testament. It's a statement of love. Eli, Eli, lama, sabachthani, and we're going to look at this for our exhortation, is not what appears to be on the surface um, in the English translation, which is added, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me, doesn't appear to be in the original. And uh, it's an interpretation of what Jesus says. And we're going to look and see that, in fact, this is the most powerful statement of trust that Jesus could make. I thirst, a statement of desire. It is finished, a statement of triumph. 
And Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit is a statement of dedication. These, are, these all bear a message which is about growing in our life and discipleship. And it all starts with compassion and mercy. Again, if we look at the Beatitudes, all of these lessons or themes come out of the Beatitude. Mercy, blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Goes right alongside, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Goes right alongside, verily I say unto thee, today thou shalt be with me in paradise. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted, goes right alongside woman, behold thy son, son, behold thy mother. Blessed are the poor or broken in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven, goes right alongside, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. Blessed are they that hunger and thirst after righteousness, Goes right alongside, of course, Jesus' statement, I thirst. Matthew 5, verse 18, Till heaven and earth pass away, not one jot or one tittle shall in any wise pass away from the Lord till all be fulfilled, accomplished, finished, the very same word that Jesus uses when he says, it is done, it is finished. And finally, Matthew 5, verse 8, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Goes right alongside, Father, into thy hands, I commend my spirit. And you can see how that Jesus' first sermon that he gave, with all of these principles and ideas, are now being outworked on the cross. And, and, and there is a construct that is there in Jesus' sermon that he gives from the cross. There is a process of growth. It starts with mercy and hope and love and trust and desire and triumph and dedication. That's our life and the truth. Our entire life starts because God first loves us. He shows mercy to us when we do not deserve it. We have done nothing and he demonstrates his mercy by calling us. And then we come under this incredible hope that not only it's, a different, it's, 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 it's what the difference is between mercy and grace. Mercy is not receiving what we deserve. In other words, death. God shows mercy. Grace is receiving what we don't deserve. Life. Eternal life. So God, God's name is merciful and gracious. It's not receiving death but then giving us life. That's mercy and hope. And as we come to see the way that God works in our life, then we can demonstrate that to other people, and it ought to outwork. If it doesn't, we haven't learned those first two lessons. If we haven't learned those first two lessons of mercy and hope, it will never outwork in love. It will never grow. But if we do learn then there's that spiritual growth which is manifest in fruits. Fruits which are shown by love. Trust. You know, I, I, I believe that God will put every disciple into a situation where at some stage in their life, he's going to take away every vestige of human deliverance or human solution to the problem that you might be facing. And, and everyone has to go through that. And I'm sure, you know, when I've talked to people, that they've been through this situation. When they go through and they might have been praying for a situation, something that seems absolutely hopeless in their life, and they've prayed and they've prayed, and it just seems to get worse and worse. It doesn't get better, it seems to get worse and worse. And when there's no answer, when there's no solution, then all of a sudden, that's when you truly break and you truly pray. And then it's as though the answer comes in an instant. As though God's really waiting for us to actually let go, 
to actually let go of every solution that we might have. And it's happened, you know, twice since I've done this series. That's what I said, be careful what you do when you study. And on two occasions, God's put me through this situation where he's torn away every answer of human deliverance that I might have and put me into this situation. And, and I don't know why, but, um, you know, I pray and I get the answer and then I go and do the same thing over and over again where I've always got an answer or a solution to my problem and I have to leave it right to the very end before I let go and pray to God. I wish I could do it just all the time. But I think that's, you know, just the challenge that we face in our relationship as we grow in the Lord. Well, the first saying, Father, forgive them, from, for they know not what they do, in Luke chapter 23, in verse 34. What brought about this saying? You know, there was all sorts of things that were happening at the cross. There were the Jews that were gathered there and they were taunting him and mocking him. He saved others. Himself he cannot save. If he's the son of God, what's he doing up there? He trusted in God that he would deliver him. God's forsaken him. That's what it is. God's forsaken him. And they threw it in his face. And there was the brutality that had happened in the whole process of the crucifixion. And then, of course, there were the Roman soldiers there. What was it that brought about the saying? It's really interesting when we look at this verse um, in, in Luke chapter 23 because we can see that what Jesus was witnessing from the cross. And we almost miss that second part when it was read to us. Um, in, in verse 34. And Jesus said to them, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And then it says, and they cast lots to divide his garments. So what's transpiring in front of the cross is the scene of them parting his garments and gambling over his clothes. And... You know, there's an there's a echo that goes through the story in, in the Bible um, to the story of Joseph, isn't there? Because wasn't it the same thing that happened with Joseph? You know, those were the garments that separated Joseph, that caused so much jealousy amongst his brethren and caused them to rise up and kill him. Genesis 37 verse 3, Now Israel loved Joseph more than any of his sons because he was the son of his own old age and made him a robe of many colors. But when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him. You know, Isaiah chapter 11, it says of Jesus, There shall come a, a, a branch and righteousness shall be the girdle of his reins. You see, it was his righteousness and his relation that he had with God which the Jews hated him for and caused so much jealousy and was the reason they were crucifying him. It was the special relationship he had with his father, just like Joseph had a special relationship with God. And just like with Joseph, and they took Joseph's robe and they slaughtered a goat and they dipped the robe in, in the blood and they sent the robe of many colors and brought it to their father and says, we have found this, please identify if it's your son robe, son's robes. It was the garments which were laid up as a witness before the father at the betrayal that Joseph faced from his brothers and his murder, as it would seem. But of course, we know that's not the end of the story of Joseph. You know, it, it, Joseph is such a remarkable story when you consider him in light of this first saying from the cross. Because, you know, forgiveness is not natural at all. It's not in human nature to forgive. Uh, the heart of man is desperately wicked. And it's not in our natural nature to forgive. 
In fact, you know, when you think about the Genesis account, you see forgiveness from God's perspective very early on in the piece with Adam and Eve and the providing for them uh, coats of skin and providing for them hope and, uh, as a way back to the tree of life and setting cherubim there and obviously in order where they could bring offerings to God. So he didn't just finish with Adam and Eve, he showed compassion. But you don't find forgiveness, you really find forgiveness in the Genesis record of man forgiving man or woman. This is the opposite, of course, revenge. Cain, rose up, Simeon, Levi, Jacob, Esau. Continuously you see these accounts of revenge. It's not until you get to the end of Genesis that you have the most, absolutely the most remarkable account of forgiveness. And, and it's there at the end of Genesis to show, you know, and demonstrate the power of God's working with man. And here was this young man, Joseph, who, you know, his, his attitude towards his brothers was such that they, they couldn't comprehend his forgiveness even when he gave it to them, you know. When he went down to Egypt and he forgave them and he says, don't be angry with yourselves, God's done this and he's brought about this salvation for the house of Jacob. Do you know, 17 years later when Jacob died, 17 years, they turned around and says, now he's going to want to kill us. Dad's dead. He hated us all the time. He didn't, really, he didn't really forgive us. 17 years, they never really believed that Joseph could forgive them. Why? Because they couldn't have done that. You know, it wasn't in their character to have done such a thing. And so they, they struggled with the comprehension that Joseph could have done this. You know, and one of the most powerful verses to me in the whole of the Bible and the story of Joseph. And let's, let's have a look at it because I think this is just, this is the story of the first saying from the cross. In Genesis chapter 43. And you get this story where they've come back and, 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 and they're so desperate for food and, and the house of Jacob has come to naught. And it says in verse 1, the famine was sore in the land and it came to pass when they had eaten up all the corn which they had brought out of the land of Egypt, their father said to them, go and buy a little food. And Judah spake unto him saying, the man did solemnly protest unto us saying, you will not see my face unless your brother is with you. Think about that. You know, Joseph, of course, represents the Lord Jesus Christ. They were to appear in judgment before the Lord Jesus Christ. You think Jesus says the same words to us? You will not see my face unless your brother is with you. Our, our life ought to be about demonstrating the same quality that Joseph had of compassion and reconciliation to our brothers and sisters. And this is the power of Jesus' first statement from the cross, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Um, I was just going to quickly show you this connection as well, and we'll just put it up there where it looks like we're running out of time. It's been normal. But um, the priest's garments, of course, were highly significant. And um, we know, of course, that Caiaphas rent his garments. And um, in comparison, it says, um, of Jesus, when they crucified Jesus, they took his garments and they couldn't rend his um, special tunic because it was seamless, woven from top to bottom, which happens to be the very same phrase which is used in the veil of the temple, which we'll come back to in our last study. Caiaphas it was a, it pretty much abdicated his office as high priest when he tore his, when he tore his garments from top to bottom because the priest wasn't meant to rend their garments. But it was the priestly garments which were meant to set him apart. It was meant to make him special. 
But here the priest had delivered God's representative to be slain, to be killed. And, and the only time you really see the subject of the garments and casting lots together come together in the story of the Day of Atonement. So we're just going to rattle through this just quickly and show you the two quotes. But one in the Day of Atonement was really a, an incredible day, the one day of the year with a high priest entered into the most holy place. But he had to lay aside his normal priestly garments in order to do that. And, and the record emphasizes that he had to put on special linen robes before he entered in and offered there for the nation. And then he would come back out and he would take those garments off and he would leave them there. And, and then, of course, is the story in Leviticus chapter 16, Aaron shall bring the goat upon which the Lord's lot fell and offer him for a sin offering, but the goat on which the lot fell shall be the scapegoat. And here you've got the story in Leviticus of the Day of Atonement where the priest's garments and the casting of lots are highlighted in regards to atonement for the nation. You see what the record says? Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do, and they parted his garments, and they cast lots for his raiment. And the record's taking you straight back into that story of the Day of Atonement. Well, the centurion that was there that day, his life would never be the same. You know, he, he was a man who had um, climbed the, uh, the ladder uh, in, in the Roman army, in the, in the ranks of the Roman army, through acts of valor on the battlefield. No one was made a centurion unless they proved themselves with acts of valor. He was a hardened soldier. He was there overseeing the affairs which were taking place at Passover to make sure there was no uprising, to make sure there was no dissent against Rome. He had been there responsible for the scourging of the Lord as the Roman centurion leading that band. He would have been responsible for his men to carry out the beatings of the Lord with rods. He had joined in with the soldiers, no doubt, early on in the peace with the mocking of this man because the soldiers also, it says, mocked him. But he had also witnessed a farcical trial that night. He'd seen a trial which should never have been conducted at night anyway, but a complete farcical trial with you know, witnesses which had to be brought up at the last minute and corroborating um, testimonies. And he'd seen all of that. And he'd heard the charge that Caiaphas said where he said he made himself the son of God. And he witnessed the challenge of the people to save himself if he's God's son. If he's God's son, save yourself. And now he hears these words, Father, forgive them. Now, can you imagine, you know, for this Roman soldier who had seen it all, he had probably been responsible for many crucifixions and executions. Hardened man. And he had seen it all. He had seen the pain and the anguish and the cries that would come from the cross. The cursings that would come. The bitterness and screams of pain that would come as these poor souls were lifted on these horrendous poles to be crucified. And he, and he had seen all of these things before. But he had seen a man that had gone through this trial who'd retained his composure like no one else. He had wondered at this man who seemed to just be in... He, he, he didn't defend himself during the trials. He never defended himself. To a large de uh, um, degree, he hardly said a word. He was like a lamb that was led to the slaughter. So much so that Pilate was even confused. You know, your own nation has condemned thee. What sayest thou of thyself? And he didn't say anything. He held his peace. And he wondered at this man's composure. 
And he would never, ever have expected what he heard from the cross. Because they all break in the end. They might act tough. You know, they might be staunch and they might be strong and they might be put up there and be able to hold their composure, but they all break. They all break in the end. Crucifixion will get them all. But not this man. In the first words that came from his mouth, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And Jesus' words from the cross obviously had a huge influence on this centurion because later in this record, he was to say, truly, this was the Son of God. And he was also to say in Luke chapter 23, verse 47, truly, he was a righteous man. Both of those testimonies from this centurion was against the Jews, wasn't it? They said he claimed to be the son of God. Now this Roman is making a public declaration, not just against the Jews, but against Rome as well. Because in saying he was a righteous man meant that he had been unjustly crucified. And that was a challenge to the Roman authorities. This was a public testimony that this man was making. Well, we're going to have to wrap this up and we'll probably pick up a little bit of um, the real exhortation behind Jesus' words that he says in, in regards to this statement of forgiveness. But in our own life, everything in terms of our relationship and our development to God starts with forgiveness. It, it's where it has to be. And you know, the, one of the greatest enemies of forgiveness, of course, is blame. Playing the blame game. Right from the very beginning, the Garden of Eden, wasn't it? You know, Adam, God said to Adam, who told you you were naked? Oh, it was the woman. She, she, and then the woman. Oh, it's the serpent. He didn't have a leg to stand on, of course, but... So, <laughs> terrible. But, but the blame game, do you know... The problem with blame, of course, it has, it's directly adverse to accountability. And, and Jesus' words from the cross are given that all might become guilty and all might become accountable. It was a universal prayer. And we need to feel the power of that prayer. We need to feel that individually and personally to see what that truly means. Because unless we've seen the power of forgiveness in our own life, there is no growth at all. There'll be many people that have gone through their life in the Lord that will come to the end and say, Lord, have we not done many wonderful things in thy name? And he will say, I don't know you. Depart from me. What's the difference? What's the difference? It's the person who sees and understands what has been done for him. What this crucifixion truly means for him. And the only way to do that is if we approach the cross. I want you to imagine approaching the cross. I want you to imagine the scene. Can you, can you picture that scene personally, individually? Imagine you're there on your own. And imagine... Imagine the scene of the cross that's there. You're seeing all the people round and all the noise. And you see these poles being put up in the distance. And you hear the noise and you want to venture forward, but you're too scared to venture forward. You know, there's something that's holding you. It's, 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 it's horrendous. The scene's horrendous. But you're compelled to go forward regardless. And as you move, move forward, you hear the pain and the anguish, the cursing of the thieves on either side of Jesus. You hear the people taunting him. You see the Roman soldiers laughing and you see them parting the garments and you move closer and closer to the cross. You're compelled to go there. You're compelled to confront that man on the cross. And as you get closer, you, you, you can't even look up. The scene is so horrific. You don't want to face what's there, but you can't turn away. You want to run away but you can't. You're just compelled to move closer and closer. And your head's down. 
And as you move closer to the one that's in the middle, with his head bowed, it's as though all of a sudden all the noise starts disappearing around you. You can, you can no longer hear the jeers and the taunting. There's silence all around you. And it's, it's as though it's just you and the man that's there on the cross in front of you. And all you can hear is the drip, drip, drip. As you look down at the bottom of the cross, you see the pools of blood. So much blood. You can smell it. It's acrid in the air. There's, there's this copper smell that you can smell. And as you lift your head, you can see his feet and the nails. And you can see the pain that's written all over his body. And you lift your head. And as you lift your head, he begins to lift his. And his eyes suddenly meet yours and all of a sudden it's like you've just been opened up it's like he, you know he can see straight through you he knows your very thoughts he knows what's right in your heart your deepest darkest secrets and you just want to disappear you feel so exposed it's him being crucified naked on the cross but it's you that feels so exposed because he can see straight through you. And as you look into those eyes, you suddenly see that instead of judgment, he knows you. He know, you know that if anybody else could see into you like he could, there would be judgment. But there's no judgment. He looks at you and there's a tenderness and there's a sincerity. And then he says something that you just cannot comprehend. Something that makes your heart completely stop. He says your name. I forgive you.